immediately following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, about a dozen businesses cut ties with the nation in a show of solidarity for the Ukrainian people. In addition, the United States and NATO allies imposed severe sanctions against Russia, Russian business leaders, politicians, and Putin himself. Professor Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, founder and CEO of Yale School of Management Chief Executive Leadership Institute, began reporting on those 12 companies. Motivated by the voluntary withdrawal from private businesses, Jeffrey and his team, led by Stephen Tien, continued to track companies exiting Russia or claiming to. The list quickly grew to 75, then 500, and is now at 1,300 companies, with 1,100 of those no longer conducting business with Russia in some form. Recently, there's been public speculation about whether government sanctions and exited businesses are enough to dissuade Putin and the Russian leaders. Putin has been vocal that these disturbances have had no consequences on his economy, and in fact, hurting her own. This disinformation has created confusion as to the actual state of Russia and whether these sanctions are working. Jeffrey and Stephen made it their mission to accurately research and report on the list of companies and the effect their withdrawal has had. They continued to dispel the myths created by Putin with their peril for research on national media and at the recent Washington Foreign Press Center briefing. Jeffrey, a longtime friend of Jim's, and Stephen, who Jim met this past spring, discuss and share their experiences. The work that you're doing here, uh, Professor Sonnenfeld uh, and uh, Stephen Tien, uh, a student at Yale College. I had this wonderful advisor named Professor Sonnenfeld, who was the Associate Dean of Leadership Studies at the Yale School of Management. What a, what a lottery pick that was for you, Stephen. And now for the years beyond your graduation, now running the uh, research activities uh, at the Yale Chief Executive Leadership Institute, all gave birth to this project. Give us some insights, Stephen, into how this idea percolated, and then we'll get into what it is you're doing now. Well, Jim, as with all things we do, I can claim absolutely zero credit for the genesis of this brilliant idea. That was all Jeff. And in, in the days immediately following the invasion, far before we got into Russian economic impact, far before we got into taking down tyrant, what this really was, was in the initial days following the invasion, we noticed just a couple of dozen, not a large amount, just a few dozen companies who had did the right thing. They pulled out of Russia in the days immediately following the invasion. But then you followed that up by seeing a, a massive flood of companies that put out statements, you know, suggesting that they might in the future pull out of Russia, but we didn't know who was the real deal versus who are the pretenders. And the very humble, narrow initial focus of our list was to simply separate out who are the genuine champions of values versus who are the pretenders. And then uh, this thing has snowballed far beyond uh, our wildest dreams in the times. And as you testified just recently at the, uh, at the State Department uh, about the impact, Jeff, you were quick to say that the initial companies that Stephen just referenced weren't uh, the woke leadership of corporate America these are primarily energy companies who are making very real and very expensive uh, decisions at that point in time. You know, that, that's exactly right, Jim. I, uh, uh, <laughs> if, this is the first book I wrote. Uh, Corporate Views of the Public Interest. That uh, This is uh, some 40 years ago. Oh, boy. Uh, boy, are you old. Uh, and <laughs> this, uh, you know, it's really pathetic is... Uh, as I look at this, as I think I still look like that. Is, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> this was in, endorsed by GE's CEO, Reginald Jones, uh, on the jacket. Uh, and he uh, he coined the term corporate social responsibility. And I bet, and so it's not a new concept, the idea that doing well is not antithetical to doing good. It can they work together? Not always, uh, but they often can. And uh, I've been taking a look at, as a sideline, a line of inquiry, looking at corporate social impact on a lot of different areas on, I don't know, immigration reform or uh, other climate change issues or who's doing what on this front, uh, voting rights, as you know, 
on this one, we were caught by surprise because exactly what you say, those first 12 were never on the front lines of any of this other work. Uh, it was big oil, uh, big tech and uh, professional service firms. And knowing each of those uh, groups as you do, uh, the big oil, they've had complications on the climate change front and uh, image issues and big tech with the antitrust and privacy and hate speech stuff. And the professional service firms, those lawyers and accountants would usually rather jump off a cliff than get involved in any geopolitical controversy. It's usually the fashion and food people and the consumer goods that are on the leading edge of the social change and uh, human rights and just social justice issues. Not these guys, but these guys had serious business reasons. And for whatever their reasons were, I applaud them for coming for different reasons to the right position, as it seemed. And and then talking with a few CEOs inside each one of those clusters, their concern was about the pretenders, the wannabes that had artful PR people creating sm a smokescreen that uh, they would found that would have quasi nonprofits celebrate them who weren't doing a darn thing. They're giving a dollar fifty, and their hearts and minds and prayers were with the uh, people of Ukraine, and they're still plowing ahead full throttle while. While BP surrendered $9 billion on the balance sheet, now turned out the market handsomely rewarded them for that. The same with, with uh, Exxon leaving about $5 billion, a little bit more than that uh, on the balance sheet. They too were rewarded by the financial markets for that, just like uh, Shell was. They were rewarded for it for pulling out, but they didn't know that was going to happen at the time. Uh, but the pretenders is where we went public. I went, uh, frankly, on uh, Fortune and CNBC to put out what uh, Stephen took a look at uh, who, who with me, who was real and who was fake, is that we identified the fraudsters, their stock, as who was truly digging in, plummeted anywhere from 12 to 33 percent immediately. And it was independent of industry or even that day's market performance. The indices were down uh, three, uh, 4 and 5% that day. It didn't account for that plunge unique to those companies. And with that news, it had kind of a salutary effect on the good guys and a, um, a kick in the rear end, sort of a carrot stick as a sort of a punitive effect on, on those that weren't so courageous. So we saw the, the list jump from, to our amazement, from 12 to 50 to 75 to 100 to 500 to uh, to 1,000, and now we're up to tracking 1,300 firms. And Stephen kept getting mad at me because trying to get Yale's IT system to keep changing our um, our Excel spreadsheet and and uh, our um, our link, we kept putting the number uh, as part of the identification, the number of companies in the link itself, and it was upsetting people. So we we had to figure out how do we not keep changing the link to get to stay current. I don't know if it was deliberate, but uh, it seems to me that there's some very distinct phases. What, 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 is there something that you call this project overall? The, the great uh, Russian retreat, but it's, uh, it's the, the Russian exits. Uh, and what we've been doing most recently, as, as you know, is uh, taking a look at the financial impact of, of those exits, uh, the economic impact on the, the Russian economy. Uh, because a lot of times um, these well-intended economic embargoes didn't work. And we try to figure out uh, what was happening here in terms of key elements of the Russian economy. And it's profound, despite some misleading uh, manufactured statistics uh, that Putin is putting out, mainly three of them. He has an arbitrary GDP number. He has a, a fake ruple number because it's not a traded currency. Uh, and he's also fired all his Rustat economists, uh, the people who produce the statistics. Well, lo and behold, with your research department, you've reassembled data from other quarters to, to get to the heart of what's really happening there. And it seems to me that when we visited, when I had the opportunity to visit with your class in May, because that was within the first 90 days of the invasion, and we had spent the whole day together, finishing up at around 6.30 or so, and as I was uh, headed uh, out to the, uh, to the car, I turned around and after an exhaustive day, Professor Sonnenfeld, you, Stephen, gathered around and about 14 or so other volunteers from the class who were working with you on this Russia project all gathered around in excitement to see what you'd been dealing with with your left hand all day in terms of over the trends in threats, threats of lawsuits, actual lawsuits. What wonderful lessons what, one, what a wonderful teaching moment and this is for you, Stephen, for your fellow researchers, for the students, for everyone at Yale, and for all of us watching what you're doing. 
And the phases of what you've been doing seem to me to be who's doing what was phase one. Uh, phase two was impact, impact on Russia and impact on the companies that you were just talking about, Jeff, the impact on companies that made the hard decisions, the impact on companies who were trying to fake it and you outed. And then, uh, and then more importantly, most recently, exploding the myth about, no, these sanctions aren't working and Russia is doing just fine, thank you, and how that's nonsense. And you did it with data. And your, your uh, presentation at the, uh, uh, the State Department and then later on to the global press was amazing. And that seems to be phase three. What's really going on in the Russian uh, economy? And ergo, what are the impacts of these sanctions? And now you're in the, the myth-busting mode, uh, playing whack-a-mole with the Russian propaganda machine in terms of the impact of the uh, sanctions, the, uh, the myth of the U.S. causing a global uh, famine, uh, potential famine and crisis. Is that fair that those are the four phases that you're working us through? And then I'm asking, what do you think the fifth phase is? Well, I must say, uh, you captured the spirit of what we're doing uh, so well. And and I just, just, in all seriousness, Jim, I don't mean this to come across as pandering, but as somebody who uh, started out life with, with humble origins, with daunting spirit, that you took on um, some behemoths that nobody thought were possible in your own core sectors, if you're really sure there's nobody to be afraid of, and you've taken on giants before, and we did too, we were taking on uh, the in, entire hundreds of thousands of macro economists that got snookered by President Putin, including at the IMF, uh, the State Department, Treasury Department uh, in the U.S. and their counterparts around the world, the Commerce Department. Uh, and um, uh, we sometimes had to take some of them on by name, as well as um, companies that sometimes didn't get it right. Uh, and as far as we know, eventually the facts prevailed and people didn't resent us. We thought even even this time last week that we would be getting a firestorm of uh, blowback of anger going through state and treasury and commerce departments and the National Security Council and the Council on Economic Advisors and in in, in in all seriousness the the CIA. We managed to get better data. We just have people that are on the grounds as thanks to Stevens' diligence and the team of forty two he's put together that are comfortable speaking. In fact, many of them are native speakers in, in the 10 key languages of Russian and Ukraine, Ukrainian and uh, Polish and uh, German and French and Mandarin, Chinese and things like that, that we are, are able are the, to. Are the Ukrainian students on this group of advisors? Uh, yeah, uh, we have we have U Ukrainian allies in Kiev right now that are part of our team. We have people in Uzbekistan and, and War Warsaw, and, but also people in Moscow. So that we had the CEO of one of the world's largest consumer goods companies and the number one player in that field, but he was a new CEO. Just to give a little clue, he used to be the CFO of Goldman Sachs, but a very nice guy uh, <laughs> stepped in. But he was brand new in the job. And on our list, uh, Andrew Ross Arkin of CNBC Squawk Box asked him, hey, I see that you're down here for still doing business in Russia. And he said, no, 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 the list is wrong. So that was uh, egg on our face because I always tell our troops we can't say anything unless we're absolutely certain that we have people's personal reputations, we have shareholder value, we have our own credibility on the line with every single statement we get demolished if anything is wrong. Of course, we were right. Uh, as we right away went back to our teams, we got photographs. We got uh, of transactions that day. We have uh, we had the. Um, the, the portfolios of the of the set of the sales we had the uh the receipts we had the phones recorded of when how they answer we had the marquee signs of the stores we had all the merchandise in the stores and things and we've had to do this multiple times but we didn't humiliate that CEO that CEO was new on the job but uh I I thought he owed us an apology which frankly we never got but he was very appreciative uh, and we let CNBC know we're not going public with this. We don't want to be quoted on this, but just for our own credibility, hear the facts uh, off the record. But we're not out for any gotcha. This is not Mike Wallace's 60 Minutes. We're trying to, to have the truth out there. And, and of course, the CEO is enormously appreciative. So the way we do it, I think, is really important. We're not out to humiliate the IMF. We're not out to humiliate that major consumer goods CEO. We're just trying to get the facts out there. And we have shown that so far we've had superior facts. And when we get out there, they they melt that the the GDP that he has as an invented number that Putin has and the 
uh, there's the, the ruple is an invented number that's not a traded currency anymore. And some economists got lazy, didn't realize that the core national income statistics of import export trade and energy and commodities and financial flows. That stuff is, he suppressed it all right now. Uh, the the foreign direct investment, the standard national in, uh, income statistics that have been in use for roughly a century and even in, from Russia for 30 years have now suddenly disappeared. How come the experts aren't asking those questions? How do that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, you pointed out in your testimony the other day that there's only one pipeline from Russia to the east and it's not completely constructed yet. That's and right. you have photographic evidence of that. And then and, it, and it's a 35, 45 day transit versus three to five day to Europe where there are multiple pipelines. So you exploded the myth that they can just divert uh, because you talked in your testimony about the fact that the uh, gas production is direct gas. It's not liquefied. They don't have that capacity. So the idea that they could just turn the valve and send it another way and keep the economy rolling is a myth. That's exactly right. The myth that Putin is an energy czar is running out of gas. If you look at Putin's speeches, he will talk very, very adamantly about this pivot to the East. He will talk about how Russia can replace all its lost markets in Europe by pivoting towards China and India. And if you take the energy issues, there's really two, and it's, diff it's a different set of issues. It says he pointed out gas and oil. It's just physically not possible, no matter how you slice and dice it. On the gas front, as you pointed out, there is one pipeline, the Power of Siberia pipeline, of which you only have certain portions that are even open for business. You have other portions of the Power of, si of Siberia pipeline, which aren't even scheduled to open until 2025, much less any other pipelines that are newly under development. Uh, last year, Russia sent 16.5 billion cubic meters of gas towards China. Russia sold 170 billion cubic meters towards Europe. That is 10 times more than the gas that they have the capacity to transit to China. And then on the oil issues, as you point out, Jim, it takes 35 days for oil tankers to get from St. Petersburg to East Asia. It takes two to five days for those same oil tankers to get from St. Petersburg to, to, to Europe, whether that's Western Europe or Northern Europe or Eastern Europe. And if you take the oil issue specifically, there's no question that Russia has been able to replace some European oil purchases with Indian and Chinese oil purchases. But there's two important dimensions that a lot of commentators miss. Number one, India and China are driving a $35 price discount to the, the WTI and the Brent benchmarks. They understand that Russia is in a very disadvantaged position and that, quite frankly, Russia needs them much more than they need Russian oil. It's always easier for a consumer of oil to replace lost suppliers than it is for a, lot, for a supplier to replace lost markets. And India and China understand that, and they're driving a very hard bargain. You saw this in the aftermath of Iran sanctions as well. So they know the game. They know what they're doing there. The second dimension that very few people understand, which is so important to the oil story, in addition to the price differentials and in addition to the transit times, is the fact that India and China are running out of storage capacity at this moment right now. Yes, in the initial months following the invasion, they binged on cheap Russian oil, as they should have. It was a $35 price differential for them. But at this point, what you see is just over the last few weeks alone, Indian Chinese oil purchases are actually going down. That and the tank running... is full? Exactly. The tank is full. So the myth that Putin is an energy czar is running out of gas because, quite literally, India and China are filling up their tanks already. Oh, so, so let's get to phase five now, which is to you, you, you two and your teams have done so much to learn about this and to shine a light on it and to bring truth to the discussion and facts and science. Use that fact uh, gathering capability and the science that you developed and your uh, thought process to help us think about what might happen. Uh, I was uh, had the occasion to sit next to Jamie Dimon at a lunch a couple of weeks ago, and his concern was what happens in the fall when uh, uh, does Putin have enough gas in his tank, Stephen, to play games with energy in Europe to uh, send a, a shock through the economic system. 
And, and then there's this other social factor. I was speaking with a friend of mine who's uh, an American but speaks Russian and Ukrainian. She voiced a concern to me a, a couple of weeks ago, which was as embracive as the wonderful people of Europe have been, particularly the Poles that we have heard so much about taking millions of refugees in, it's beginning to wear thin. And she's concerned that about how the social pressures are beginning to build in Europe, that we play a short game and Putin plays a long game. Question to you is, does Putin have, uh, Putin have the cards that he can play the long game? And what are your expectations about what the fall will bring? In terms of energy, People have seen Putin uh, wrongly as this savvy global energy czar. Uh, He's not. As Stephen went through those numbers, with the $35 uh, a barrel discount on oil, which is now uh, around $83, $84, maybe $85 a barrel, uh, is uh, uh, given that they are OPEC's third largest producer, but also the most inefficient. So as this $45 a barrel and you're you're looking at uh, somewhere you know at fifty dollars uh, or 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 less uh, in terms of revenue, because they if that's their market is Russia and China, uh, that when you put in the transportation costs of as Stephen said instead of those five to seven days or three to seven days, thirty four days, they're at break even. So uh, it's not and the gas. He can't sell it anywhere uh, as that after December 5th, uh, uh, Europe will buy none of it. 83, 84 percent of his gas was going into Europe. Europe at its peak was buying 44, 45 percent of of their needs from there. Now they're getting most of it from the U.S. and Norway. And soon, thanks to German uh, conversion plants under construction that were not even on the books six months ago, that by the end of this calendar year in time for the winter, they should have a conversion for LNG back to vapor, which is what Europe needs, so they can get even more from outside of Russia. So Russia has nowhere to sell gas problems. The Russian gas producer is down by a third. Now they're just leaving it in the ground. In terms of uh, the strains, uh, you know, I don't want to get into sort of the ethnic and racial and religious issues, but there certainly was a lot of blowback about uh, the flight from the Middle East into Europe that was leading to uh, increasingly uh, anxious societal tensions. Uh, For whatever reason, these uh, uh, Ukraines are being uh, very eagerly uh, absorbed into Eastern and Central European society. So you are not seeing that resentment. The latest reports out of Poland is that we're somewhere close to 100% of the working age population which has come into Poland has from Ukraine is fully employed and needed to be so. Uh, they need those, the, those workers. And the people who are out of the workforce, the older people, have now gone back in. So you have these retired as engineers and plumbers and contractors, electricians and things that are, that are taking these old um, uh, KGB buildings that were abandoned or seized in, in, in Warsaw and in and, and Poland and, and refigured as uh, housing uh, for Ukraines with Ukraines doing the work. To, so it is, it is remarkable. We, we aren't seeing those strains. And, uh, but you, you, your question is a really good one because you sometimes have uh, families in small homes taking in five visitors from Ukraine. How can they not resent it? But so far, um, the, the self-reliance of the Ukrainians coming in and, the, and the, that they're so productive. And, 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 and again, I don't know if it's the, the ethnic uh, homogeneity between them that helps uh, the religious issues. I don't know if that's some of it too, but, but for whatever reason, it, it seems to be working for now. Stephen, any thoughts on that? I would just jump in on the cohesiveness and the unity of Europe that we've seen. Oh yeah. Up There's a lot of talk that because Putin's opened essentially a new front in this conflict by withholding gas supplies from the Nord Stream 1 pipeline running at 20% of normal capacity, that he's going to be able to force Europe's hand. We were criticism between the US and Europe or within Europe itself, between uh, countries like Germany and and Poland versus France and Spain or Turkey and vice versa. And, And that we're just not seeing signs of that right now. And there's a whole counter narrative Uh, that's supported by the data, which is very rarely heard 
right now. If you look at German gas storage levels, they're at 73% right now, which actually exceeds the storage level of last year. As you know, with most crises, they're the crises that you don't see coming, not the crises that you see coming months in advance. And at, at this point, policymakers are basically doing everything they can to onboard new gas supplies and new energy supplies, even beyond gas, while cutting down demand. You look at Germany, they have six regasification terminals coming on board over uh, the winter of the spring months. Six regasification terminals. Um, just seven months ago, at the start of the year, you would have said that Germany of all countries would be building regasification terminals to increase uh, the amount of US and Nor Norwegian LNG, which can come ashore. That would have been absolutely insane. Um, but And you look at, for example, European policymakers, whether it's Olaf Scholz, whether it's Robert Habeck, making trips over to Qatar, to Norway, to Algeria to secure new gas supplies. Um, the supply story is actually a very different story than what is conventionally accepted because German policymakers and European policymakers more broadly understand the challenges. You look at the pipeline that's being built to connect the Portuguese gas system to Germany right now, everyone's chipping in. And of course, worst comes to worst, there is the provision for the 15% gas rationing, the cut back on demand come the winter months, should the winter be harsher than anticipated. So in short, there is a plan that is in place to tackle this. You see increasing supply on the supply side, and if necessary, you can cut back on demand on the demand side. And at this point, Europe understands the, the importance of staying united against Putin's divide and conquer tactics. Which is pretty remarkable. We, there, we were hearing some rumbles in European press. There was concern, cynical media, that somehow Europe wouldn't come together for that 15% rationing, which was incredible. There was remarkably little dissent uh, that they rallied uh, and so that they're cutting back on their gas consumption. And frankly, uh, we were sh shocked by that. But people understand it, even though some of the media have looked for drama that isn't there yet. Let me ask you about one other myth. You've been myth busting uh, on the scientific front, on the energy front. Tell me, what are your thoughts about the myth of the vaunted Russian military? Certainly, he's he's misguided on that. I, I don't um, imagine that anybody viewing our discussion besides you and me, uh, Jim, would uh, remember Seven Days in May, the great film. But they have two leadership styles in there where there is a, an attempted military takeover of the United States government and the bad guys played by Burt Lancaster. The good guy is the, the, the president, I think, played by Frederick March. I'm not sure I remember, but Kirk Douglas is really uh, the forceful uh, renegade uh, military leader who is kind of the whistleblower, does the right thing. And you see one group is a very kind of uh, haphazard, uh, ad hoc, but a participatory and honest and virtuous group. And that's the president and his and his casual advisors trying to figure out the truth. And the military takeover is very dogmatic, autocratic, uh, uh, brutal, uh, but nobody believes in it. And and when one piece falls in, in the attempted coup, the whole thing collapses. And that's what we see here with the Russian military is uh, – that uh, people misquote Machiavelli all the time, that a leader can be loved or respected. There's such a thing like like Zelensky admire, represents somebody, President Zelensky, can be both loved and respected. Putin is feared, but that doesn't mean he's loved. And as things crumble, we can see these generals are you know, falling like dominoes, is that in a, in a system that is built on coercion and fear, it can topple quickly, as we saw in East Germany, we saw in Romania, we saw in Poland, we saw in Libya, we saw in Argentina and Chile, is uh, that's what gives us uh, encouragement here, is that if you can stall out civil society, the military will also crumble when people lose faith in the legitimacy. But uh, he certainly has... Um, uh, both his military hardware and his military morale, he has uh, way overestimated, just like he underestimated uh, the Ukrainian resolve and, and global unity against him. Uh, I would just add, uh, to complement the political and military angles with the economic sanctions angle as well, our new peace out in foreign policy, how to take down a tyrant, examines exactly the question of whether all of this will work 
whether all of this can actually succeed in taking down Putin. And too often, in political circles especially, there's this idea that sanctions are just what you use when you've run out of options on the political and military and diplomatic fronts. And that is just not the case. In fact, economic sanctions are one of the most powerful tools in the arsenal. And not only is it one step short of bombs and bullets, but if you look at the structural erosion of civil society that Jeff was pointing towards in the cases of East Germany and Poland and Romania and so many others, um, what will induce the military to act is the structural erosion of civil society through economic collapse. Uh, the military is responsive to what's going on domestically. And, and it's not just the military, it's, uh, it's institutions across civil society. The only surefire way of inducing that discontent, which is necessary in order to you know, uh, uh, spark a catalyst and whether, whatever that catalyst is, who knows, but to have the underlying groundwork laid is, is to do so by eroding the productive capabilities of a national economy. And that's what sanctions combined with business retreats are doing. That's why they're so potent. And that's why time after time, in our piece, we look at 10 case studies of, of authoritarian tyrants who were abruptly taken down by their own people through relatively blood, bloodless regime change uh, after the structural erosion uh, of their economies. So, so very interesting and uh, not at all surprising that you would take it so so broadly from the military to the social to the uh, uh, civilian construct there, fascinating. The work that you're doing on the Russia Project is uh, something that the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and the Washington Post all would have loved to have done themselves. So I think the impact you're having is clearly on this whole uh, Ukrainian-Russian conflict and its ramifications throughout the world. I think you're having a major impact. What are you hearing? What's the blowback? Is Putin and his propaganda machine aware of what you're doing and are you hearing about it? We certainly know um, in Ukraine, it's followed very closely as well as the rest of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I, uh, I happily have not heard from uh, President Putin directly. I have heard from vandals who have spoken on his behalf. We really have uh, a very elevated security as a consequence. Uh, but, uh, Stephen, I don't think we've – there was one Russian professor. You know, if you were to go to my Twitter feed, you find that we've set, we've set a record on something called SSRN, the Social Science Research Network. It, they have 1 million, over 1,200,000 manuscripts that are research monographs that are on online scholarly journals. Uh, we are close to number one for the year and top, top handful for the year. But also, we're, uh, and that includes all the viral uh, uh, pandemic work and everything else. But we're also um, number one on everything economics, financial, governance, uh, sociological, political science related, all those journals, uh, accounting. We, we somehow, this research is number one on that. Uh, and there are these various YouTube sites and TikTok sites that we have nothing to do with that have animated our data. And each of this is, those are one to two million viewers apiece. We've had somewhere around 60 million uh, views to our own website, but on this scholarly site, the SSRN site, we've had somewhere around 270,000 people view it, which has really set a record for them. So we're we're kind of excited about that with, I don't know, close to 80,000 of them downloading it to, ke to keep it for posterity. Uh, but if you go to the Twitter feed, uh, what's astounding to me is uh, is how the economists and ambassadors, diplomats, uh, they've all embraced it. We don't have a single critical word there. There was somebody who sent a private note who was a, a Russian uh, uh, economist, uh, and uh, we bludgeoned them with the data, and he went silent. Uh, and But nothing's on Twitter where, you know, uh, and frankly, just getting through the Yale economics departments, <laughs> I'm amazed. We could have, um, we could have, you know, the orange drink in the cafeteria could be toxic, and we'd have a faculty debate for days <laughs> as to whether or not to remove it. It doesn't take much to have dispute on campus and to have the unanimity of support from colleagues. You know, the kind of attention we've gotten is almost the curse of being on the, uh, you know, the cover of Sports Illustrated is you get a lot of, uh, often a lot of uh, blowback and and, uh, and collegial envy, uh, but we haven't gotten any of that. You know, when Truman Capote won the Writer's Circle Award for In Cold Blood, his lifelong frenemy Gore Vidal said, every time something good 
happens to one of my friends, a little something within me dies. And, <laughs> and that's so frankly we expected from colleagues. And so far, knock on wood, uh, I I was more worried about collegial blowback than Putin's, and uh, so far uh, it's it's unanimous support. Am I overstating it, Stephen? I would jump in on the first part of it because just to highlight why Jeff needs the police protection. Uh, Jeff is ranked number six on Putin's enemies list, uh, as you all may know. Putin Come on, Jeff, you can do better. I think I may have gotten a promotion this week, but I haven't seen the list. But right now, we're well above Mitch McConnell, but somewhere below the, uh, the Biden family. So I don't know how much of a promotion I want, though. I think uh, that's we're already uh, exposed enough. Uh, we've had a couple of discussions, uh, uh, podcasts, interviews, uh, and, uh, and exchanges on all this. I can't think of one that was anywhere near as gratifying and comprehensive as this one. Can you, Stephen? I can't. And the depth of insight, the level of thoughtfulness, this was something special. Guys, thanks. Okay. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for being so generous with your time. Most importantly, uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you.